The scripture for today is from James 3, 13 through 18. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ginger. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 3, be in verses 13 through 18 this morning as we continue in our current sermon series that I have entitled uh, Real, the Unmistakable Marks of Genuine Disciples. We're taking a journey through the book of James. You can see where we've gone up to this point. We have just a couple more weeks left in that, and I hope it's been challenging to you as we've looked at the standards, the benchmarks that James has set for people who want to be able to genuinely call themselves disciples or followers of Jesus Christ. Just to review, the book of James was written by uh, not just any James, but James the brother of Jesus, a man who went through much of his adult life believing that Jesus was a crazy man, feeling ashamed of Jesus, wishing Jesus would just be quiet and get along with everybody else. And it wasn't until after the resurrection of his brother that he recognized Oh my goodness, Jesus is who he really says he is. And so he becomes a very important and powerful part of the early church. He's writing this letter to persecuted believers in Jerusalem, and he's confronting people who have become lukewarm in their faith. It's people who have many of the same struggles that you and I have today, where we believe that Jesus is returning someday. We wish it would be soon. We know it's not today, and it wasn't yesterday. Maybe it will be tomorrow. But in the meantime, our faith just kind of cools off a little bit, and we struggle, and we begin to compromise. And so the main theme of the book is that if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we must act like Jesus. There is no half in and half out. Last week, we looked at uh, one of the hallmarks of being a true follower of Jesus, which is that we tame the tongue. We control our mouth. And I don't know about you, but it was very convicting for me to do the study for that and put that together because I could see a lot of myself in the admonitions that James was giving to us. We learn that words matter because they can kill relationships, because they can distance us from God, and that in the, in the end, they have to be steered in the right direction. And we discovered that disciples have to learn to use the power of words, not for their own purposes, but for Christ's. And so uh, this week, we talked about something that follows very closely, as we'll see, which is humility. How do we become humble followers of Jesus. Uh, I am just starting a new semester at Sterling and I have a bright, fresh-faced, large group, new group of uh, intro to general psychology students who are sitting in front of me on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And one of the things we talked about very early in the class because it's foundational to the study of psychology is Pavlov's dogs. How many of you are at least somewhat familiar with that? Yeah, Pavlov was a biologist in Russia back in the 1800s who I don't know whether he got in trouble or whether he made somebody mad, but he had a really disgusting job. He was doing this research project on what things made dogs slobber and how much they would slobber in response to different things. And so he did surgery on this group of dogs and ran tubes from their salivary glands to these glass flasks that would hang around their neck. And he would expose them to different stimuli, and then he would measure how much they drooled. And of course, we know some dogs drool a lot, some dogs don't drool so much, but it's a natural process. Uh, we know that you don't have to make a dog slobber. It will slobber naturally in response to food. And so Pavlov became curious because as he went through his daily tasks, he noticed that 
he didn't have to even put the food in front of the dogs at a certain point. They would just start slobbering in anticipation of the food. They knew what time the food was coming and they would begin to salivate. They knew the sound of the footsteps of the man who fed them. And as those footsteps came down the hall, they would begin to salivate. And so as an experiment, he began pairing that natural phenomenon that would cause salivation with something that would not naturally cause salivation, which is uh, the ringing of a bell. And I always tell my students, you know, you ring a bell and it doesn't naturally make a dog slobber. They'll do this thing where they'll turn their head, or maybe they'll bark, or they'll howl, but they won't naturally slobber in response. And so he put these two stimuli together, the presentation of the food with the ringing of the bell. And he did this over and over and over again, and after a certain amount of time, he just rang the bell. And lo and behold, what do you think happened? The dog started to slobber, right? And so he created this thing that we call today classical conditioning. But as subsequent uh, psychologists came along and studied this phenomenon, they discovered what we call the acquisition curve or the learning curve. And you can see this in the graphic. Uh, if we have the vertical axis, which is the strength of that learning that's taking place, the association between the food and the ringing of the bell, and then on the horizontal axis, we have the number of times those are presented together. Notice what you see is the first time Pavlov uh, rang the bell, dogs didn't slobber in response to it. But over time, as we pair it, you notice that that curve begins to rise and rise and rise until we reach a peak where we have learned when the bell is rung, I get fed and I slobber. Uh, so I see this with my students all the time. Some of my students come from other school settings where you can wander into class whenever you want to and you can talk when the teacher is talking and you can play on your phone when the teacher is talking. Those things don't fly in my class. Uh, some of you know I'm a time-oriented person and so if we have an 11 o'clock class, I shut the door at 11 o'clock and I start taking roll. And if you come strolling in at 11.02, you have an unexcused absence and I will invite you to turn around and leave my class and try to be back on time the next time. Does that happen magically the first day of class? No, thank you for playing. It does not. There's an acquisition curve in place where they're learning. Oh, Dr. Mills is serious. He doesn't play these games like some other people do. And so uh, over time, as I work with them and we have this stimulus and this response pieced together, we begin to learn. And we've got issues here, apparently. idea of a steep learning curve. We say, okay, we're going into this class and there's going to be a steep learning curve. And what we're saying by that essentially is it's going to take a long time to get from low to high on that acquisition curve. So steep learning curve means that the activity is difficult to learn. Humility is one of those things that involves a steep learning curve. We can't just flip a switch. We can't just wave a wand. We can't just say, okay, today I choose to be a humble person. There is a steep, steep learning curve involved, and that's what we're going to see today. Our foundational thought for this morning is that mature Christians are willing to accept the fact that humility is a difficult practice that must not only be learned, but also internalized. It has to become a part of who we are. The great Scottish theologian Andrew Murray has written an entire very dense, very complex book on the subject of humility. And it, it takes a long time to get through and digest, but a very powerful passage here. He says this, Humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is to expect nothing, to want, to expect nothing, to wander at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord when all around and above is trouble. That sounds really great, doesn't it? We all wish there was a humility pill we could take and we would be at this place where things don't bother us anymore. But it's a steep learning curve. So I'm going to show you how to move along that today. 
The question we're going to answer this morning from the book of James is how do I attain humility? And we're going to see that there are three points that we have to reach along a learning curve. We're going to learn first that unselfish people have to learn wisdom. So we have to work on selfishness first. Once we achieve wisdom, then we get to work on being honorable, our second point. And then once we become honorable, we can work on humility. One sentence sermon this morning is that disciples are committed to moving along faith's learning curve throughout their life. The good news is this morning it doesn't matter whether you're 10 or 90, wherever you are on that learning curve, you can continue to move toward humility if you choose to do so. So I've tried to lay this out so that you can follow because this, it gets a little bit convoluted. You can see there are basically these four qualities, that, or these three qualities that we have to attain on the road to humility. We start at the top with unselfishness. Unselfishness moves us to wisdom. Wisdom moves us to honorable living. And finally, honorable living takes us to humility. Humility is something we talked about last week when we were uh, discussing uh, the early part of James chapter 3. And he talked about the relationship between controlling our tongue and humility. And I used the illustration of the Native American tribe, the Comanche tribe, and how they rose to dominance in the plains area uh, during the 17 and 1800s because they learned to domesticate the wild horse and how they did that with the lasso of that horse and they would choke it and they would choke it and they would choke it until it passed out and when they allowed the horse to come back around again it had learned it had been what we call meeking it the horse had been meeked or broken it had been brought under control and the cool thing about it was the horse didn't lose its power but now that power was under control and so in the greek when we talk about humility we're using the word picture of a horse that has been meek or broken. God doesn't want to break us to the point where we lose our power, but he wants our power to be under control. So the first step is we have to move from unselfishness to wisdom. James says this, jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Instead, such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Speaking of things that are demonic, if you've ever had a teenager in your house, you know that there is a slow and gradual but also very sudden transformation that takes place somewhere around the age of 11 or 12. You have this formerly happy, cheerful, compliant, loving child who wakes up one morning and they've turned into something altogether other. Uh, they become difficult to get along with. They become moody. They become unpredictable. They become selfish. And they become fixated sometimes on things that we as adults look at and go, why does that matter? I don't understand why you're getting so upset about this. David Elkind was a developmental psychologist who studied adolescents and he became famous because he developed this theory that he called uh, adolescent egocentrism. He said this is why teenagers act the way they act and why we can be assured that they will move through it into adulthood and regain their minds again at some point. He said basically there are two different things that are going on in the mind of an adolescent that makes them act the way they do. The first one is what he calls the imaginary audience. If you can remember back to your days of being a teenager, you, this immediately becomes flooding back because you wake up one morning and you start to feel like everybody's looking at me, everybody's watching me, they're noticing the zits on my face, they're noticing that my voice cracks, they're noticing that my hair doesn't look perfect today, they're noticing that I don't have a certain type of shoes. And because everybody is watching me and they're doing that so intently, they're watching as intently as I watch myself. They're looking for things to judge. And so school and being out in public becomes this perilous place where if I don't have everything just right, if I'm not on point, people are going to find something to make fun of me about, and it's going to be a disaster. And so you get to the point where I did when I was at this age, and I can remember uh, my dad was supposed to drop me off at the movies, and I was going to meet some of my friends, and we got about a block away, and what did I say to my dad? Drop me off here. Do not drop me off in front of the movie. That would be embarrassing. That would be catastrophic. And those of you who know my dad know exactly what he did. He pulled up right in front of the movie theater, made me get out, and then he accidentally honked the horn really loud so that everybody standing in line turned around and watched me getting out of the car. It was excruciating and it scarred me for many, many years afterwards. And, uh, you know, many of my problems in life I blame on my dad for being there. Not really. But it's an example of the imaginary audience because I was just sure everybody would remember that for the rest of our lives. The second piece of it is what's called the personal fable. The personal fable says that when we realize that 
we are in front of this imaginary audience all the time, we also start to adopt this idea that I am extremely important. I am unique. Normal rules should no longer apply to me. So other kids can't do this, but I should be able to because I want to. Or I know the assignment was due uh, today at the beginning of class, but I didn't get it done. Therefore, you should make an exception for me because I'm me. I'm the future star of the world. Everybody's watching me. I'm under all this pressure. So I'm going to get really upset if you hold me to those same standards. So thankfully, we pass through this particular season of life, and Elkind observes this. He says, the mature adult is one who can love and allow himself to be loved, who can work productively, meaningfully, and with satisfaction. This is that journey away from egocentrism, away from selfishness, towards wisdom in life. The word James uses here in the Greek for selfishness, eretheia, means rivalry. It means I'm working solely for my own benefit. It is a really accurate word picture of somebody who feels like they're on stage and everybody's looking at them and they want all the credit. This is mine. I do it my way. You have to follow my rules. Great example of this from the last church I worked at. They had a long-standing ministry. It was a fantastic one. But they called Frog Diner. And FROG was an acronym for fully relying on God. And one night a week, they, uh, they had gone around and made these deals with Dylan's, and they would get free food donations from Dylan's, and they would take sometimes money out of their own pockets, and they would put together this huge dinner, and people from the surrounding communities would come in, and on an average Wednesday night, uh, they would serve 100 to 150 people, just an absolutely free of charge dinner. It was a time for fellowship, it was a time for community, and then afterwards the church would have youth activities, they would have Bible studies, so we could just say, hey, while you're here, why don't you send your kids to youth group and come to Bible study? And it was a really great outreach. But as time went on, some of the people who had founded this started getting into their 60s and their 70s, and they began to complain and say, I'm tired of doing all the work, I've been doing this for years, I want help. Other people should come in and help us. And so I noticed this phenomenon that would happen is that people would volunteer and they would say, great, be here at 4 o'clock Wednesday afternoon when we start cooking and we'll put you to work. And a week later, two weeks later, those people would walk away shaking their heads and say, I can't deal with this. And I wondered what was going on, so I would kind of spy on the situation and see what would happen. And what I noticed was that the people who had started it felt like they owned the project and so people would come in to help and they would say okay this is how we do this and this is how we do that and no you're doing that wrong and new people would come in and they would say well okay I can do it this way but what if I chop the potatoes this way or what if I wash the dishes this way and the people who had started it would say no are you stupid we do it this way chop the potatoes like this or get out and nine times out of ten the people would go I, I think I'll get out I, I don't think this is for me the problem was the people who started this were working for their own benefit. They were saying, I own this ministry, I'm in the spotlight, it's all about me, and they drove people away. So the first step toward humility then is learning to let go of that need to be admired, that need to be in charge, that need to have other people recognize me and obey me. We see this used by Paul later in Philippians 2 verse 3. He says, don't be selfish, don't be irritated. Don't try to impress others, but instead be humble. And how do we become humble? We become unselfish. We stop thinking of ourselves as better than others, but instead we emulate the attitude that Christ had. And so we see that as we begin to let go of that need to be admired, we start to see the world differently. We're able to emulate the example of Christ, who humbled himself to the point where he washed his disciples' feet. He took the lowest of the low goal even though he was their leader. And he said, follow my example when I'm gone. Key point number one. Unselfish people understand that my path to fulfillment is not found in getting my way. We mistakenly believe, if I just get my way, if people will just do what I want them to do, if they'll just stop making me mad and annoying me, getting in my way, then I will be fulfilled. I'll be happy. But the real path is found in giving God his way. Ellen G. White puts it really well. She says, a Christian reveals true humility by showing the gentleness of Christ, by being always ready to help others, by speaking kind words and performing unselfish acts. Philippians 2.3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, 
But rather, in humility, do what? Value others above yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but each of you for the interests of others. The road to humility begins with stopping with the selfishness, stopping with the self-centeredness, and becoming an other individual. Step number two is then we move from wisdom to honorability. James continues and he says, if you are wise and if you understand God's ways, prove it. Change the way you are living. Eric Erickson, we've talked about his theory multiple times. We did an entire series on uh, the character of Abraham and we moved him through those different stages in Erickson's development. And you remember, maybe you remember that at the eighth and final stage, we reached this conflict that Erickson calls ego integrity versus despair. He says we reach one of two places toward the end of our life. We either reach a place where we understand what life is all about, we're able to become wise people, he says the resolution of that stage is wisdom, or we become people who live in despair. We're sad, we're bitter, we are full of regret. So Erickson in his research noted that achieving wisdom involves several important things. The first of those is he says wise people make a habit late in life of revisiting and evaluating previous crises. In other words, they're running the film back on their lives and they're going, okay, how did I get through difficult situations in the past? I always tell my students, this is why when you sit down with your grandparents and your great-grandparents, they keep talking about things that happened 30 years before you were born, 40 years before you were born. It's not because they're trying to be boring, they're not trying to be irrelevant, but because they've been revisiting, they've been evaluating their lives, and they have discovered important things that they're trying to teach you, to save you those mistakes in life, if you're smart enough to listen. The second is, wise people tend to renew and continue social accomplishments. They recognize, okay, this served me well. I was an unselfish person. I served on the Pine Village board. I sacrificed one night a month to go be a part of that. I was a part of some of these events, and I was rewarded for that. I made new friends. I gained status in the community. My life was better because I did that particular thing. And so because of that, I'm going to continue to do that in my later life. And finally, we creatively apply lessons learned in life to current problems. We are always problem solving. We're always trying to understand how is what God has put me through in the past applied to what I'm doing now. Erickson says this, Wisdom is an informed and detached concern with life itself, even in the face of death. In other words, we face death, we face the difficulties of the end of life, and we say, I've got this. I've lived a full life. I've made good decisions and bad decisions along the way, but I've learned from them, and I can make it. It'll be okay. The word wisdom here uh, that uh, James used in the Greek means clarity, it means insight, or it means skills. In other words, I've gained something from the experiences I've been through, and I've gotten better as a result. It's the word Sophia, where we get uh, philosophy and several other English words. So we notice here that Luke notes in Luke 2.52 that Jesus had to grow in wisdom. He had to grow in Sophia as well as growing in stature and in favor with God and all the people. In other words, there's a progression. As we become wiser, life gets better. We get along better with others. We interact more effectively with God. And so the hope is that we develop wisdom throughout our lives. So the second step toward humility is that we have to gain this Sophia, this wisdom. We have to learn to look at our life honestly, and we have to use what we've learned to live a better life moving forward. We don't keep making the same mistakes. We don't demand that life change to accommodate us, but instead we change to accommodate life. Second key point is that wise people understand they are never done learning and growing, but instead that we are always being presented with opportunities for sanctification, opportunities to become more and more like Christ. Uh, this is one of the challenges of serving congregations that trend toward older is because there's a tendency as we get older to idealize the way things used to be and to resist change. And so, you know, along the way during my time here, we've made some changes and we are continuing to make some changes as we're going. And sometimes people react with wisdom. Sometimes people react rather childishly. They respond with anger. They respond with petulance. And we try to be patient. We try to wait for people to move through that. 
But the bottom line is, if you're going to gain wisdom, you have to be willing to change as the world around you changes. Uh, you can see uh, James 3.17 talks about this. It says, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and it's willing to yield to others. It's willing to recognize there's going to come a day when I'm no longer at this church, when I've gone on to eternity to be with God, but there are younger people coming along behind me who need the church, who need the church to be relevant to them. The church might mean something different to them. We might have to change, and that's okay. In other words, actions reflect what's going on internally. I love this quote from Garrison Keeler. He says, anyone who thinks sitting in church can make you a Christian must also think that sitting in a garage can make you a car. It's not just enough to be here. We have to be interacting with the Word. We have to be growing and changing and becoming progressively new creations. Last movement here is from honorability, finally, to humility. As we move from wisdom to honor, we begin to move from honor to humility. James concludes, and he says, we do this, we demonstrate that we have become wise people by living an honorable life, by doing good works with the humility that comes from <laughs> wisdom. Sigmund Freud uh, had some really strange ideas, but he also had some really great ideas. And one of the most powerful ones that we've hung on to over the years as the science has progressed is the idea that a lot of stuff happens in our minds that's beneath or underneath our awareness. Uh, he talked about the subconscious, about the unconscious, and you can see here, uh, we use this illustration with students of the iceberg. Uh, we know that only about 10% of the iceberg, is where we get the term tip of the iceberg, is above the surface, underneath is the other 90%. And Freud argued that we're only aware of about 10% of what's going on in our minds and our emotions at any given time, and the other 90% is unconscious. It's things that we're not aware of and that have to be brought to our consciousness. Uh, these things are indicative of what's going on underneath the surface. Freud says this, uh, these phenomena are not accidental. They have meaning and they can be interpreted. One is justified in inferring the presence of restrained or repressed impulses. And you're saying, those are great words. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. Those of you who are female and you have taught grade school before, grade school kids, how many of you have had the experience where a child accidentally calls you mommy or mom? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. Freud would say that's subconscious. They are identifying you with their mother figure. Maybe they are wishing their mom were as nice and kind and fun and beautiful as you are, and so they accidentally call you mom or mommy. Uh, I had another example in therapy just this last week. A man came in, and he was wanting help dealing with his teenage daughter. He has three boys, and the youngest is this girl, and she's transitioning into adolescence, and they're just... They're just buttheads, and he can't stand her, and she's disrespectful, and she's rebellious, and she's selfish, and she's all these different things. And uh, we'll say her name is Tina, and so you know we're talking about Tina, and he's complaining about her, but when he says Tina, he keeps calling her Sheila. He keeps saying, oh, Sheila just won't follow the rules. Sheila all thinks about herself, and I'm stopping to go, who are we talking about here? Sheila, my daughter, are you paying attention? I thought your daughter's name was Tina. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Sheila, Sheila's my sister. Never mind, sorry about that. And he goes on and he's talking about it some more and he keeps referring to his daughter as Sheila again. And so we finally stop and we do a little investigation and we go back and we realize, oh my goodness, guess what? He was one of three boys and the youngest child in his family growing up was his sister Sheila. And Sheila was a spoiled brat. And Sheila uh, went out when she became a teenager and got herself pregnant. And so when she was a freshman in high school, and he was a senior, and he was supposed to be getting all this recognition and attention from his family for being all state in football and all district in basketball and being a, the valedictorian of his class, guess who everybody in his family was focused on? Little sister Sheila, who was irresponsible and selfish and went out and got pregnant and was using alcohol and drugs. And so what I had to bring to his consciousness was that he was associating his resentment at Sheila from 30 years ago with his daughter, who is now becoming an adolescent. And maybe there's a possibility that Tina really doesn't have that big of a problem, but his problem is with Sheila. And so he has to go back and do some forgiveness work. He has to go back and resolve his relationship with Sheila. And when he does that, guess what's going to happen? Tina's not that bad of a kid. Actually, I kind of like Tina, and I love Tina, and I can walk with Tina through this difficult chapter in her life. 
but you have to become aware of this. The word for honorable talks about this particular concept. In the Greek, an astrophe means upturning. It means an observable outward change of behavior where the inner things that we are not conscious of working its way outward. We're moving up from the unconscious into the conscious and we are dealing with it. Honorable people take the things they've learned along the way and it comes into their head and they go, oh my gosh, this is what I've been doing wrong my entire life. Now I'm going to live a different life. Peter talks about this in 2 Peter 2 verse 7. He talks about Lot, Old Testament character. He says, God rescued Lot out of Sodom. Did he rescue Lot out of Sodom because uh, Lot was important? No. Because Lot was smart? No. He rescued him because he was anastrophe. He was honorable. He had changed his behavior outwardly. And how do we know that? Because he became sick of the shameful immorality of the people around him. When the messengers of the Lord came to visit Lot's house and all of the residents of Sodom wanted to drag these men out on the street and rape them, Lot put his own family on the line in order to protect them. He said, this is not honorable. This is not God's way. And I'm willing to pay a price for that. And so when God destroyed Sodom, he rescued Lot because there was an observable change of behavior based on an inward change of heart that had taken place within Lot. So the third step toward humility is allowing those inner workings of unselfishness and wisdom that we've learned in the first two steps to begin to manifest themselves, to change us outwardly. It is outward evidence of an inward change. Last key point. <coughs> Honorable people understand it's not about everybody else. Change in every situation begins with me. The great Christian writer Leo Tolstoy puts it this way. He says, everyone thinks about changing the world, but no one thinks about changing himself. The Proverbs summarizes this very, very well. Whoever pursues righteousness and love will find life and prosperity and honor. When we pursue the right things in life, all the stuff we've been looking for falls into place. But it begins with being an honorable person who's willing to change themselves based on what God has taught them. Three questions to ask yourself this week. Number one, is my life built on the demand that I be recognized, that I be admired, that I be obeyed, for who I am or for what I do. And if so, how soon can that change? Number two, does my lifestyle indicate that I'm still learning, that I'm still growing, that I'm still on that sanctification journey, or am I demanding that we time warp back to 1987 and keep things just the way they were? And finally, am I focused on changing others, or am I open to what needs to change within 